presentation in uh, this session today, a compressed overview of sparsity uh, by Steve Brunton from the University of Washington. So uh, continuing our Princeton theme, I guess. Um, so Steve got his, his BS degree from Caltech. Uh, he subsequently went on and, and did a, a PhD at Princeton um, uh, with Clancy Rowley. And currently, he is on the uh, mechanical engineering faculty uh, at the University of Washington. So, Steve. All right. Uh, well, first of all, thank you to Sam and Doug for organizing this uh, and for all of you for attending. This has been a very uh, enjoyable session. <clears throat> and uh, so I'm going to talk about compressed sensing and sparsity. And notice that this is not a modal decomposition. This is not specific to fluid dynamics. Uh, but I do want to point out that I'm taking the perspective as an engineer. So the things I care about are, can I get away with a few sensors instead of lots of sensors? Instead of measuring an entire flow field uh, or time-resolved flow fields, can I get away with subsampling my data? And I think one of the really important themes throughout this entire session is that coherent structures exist in even very complex flows. Patterns exist, and we can leverage those patterns to sparsely sample uh, our systems of interest. So before starting, I just want to acknowledge a number of my close collaborators on topics of sparsity uh, and in fluid, excuse me, fluid dynamics. Okay, so compressed sensing. Uh, first of all, how many of you have heard of compressed sensing? Okay, more than half of you. How many of you have actually worked with compressed sensing, tried an example in MATLAB? Okay, about 20, 25% of you. Uh, how many of you have listened to an MP3 audio or played around with the JPEG on your computer? <laughs> right, everyone. Okay, so compression is the basis of basically all uh, data communication that we use today, right? When you talk on the phone, when you send a picture, it's all built on compressibility of natural data signals. Uh, and signals in fluid dynamics, like a vorticity field or a velocity field, are no exception. These are highly compressible signals, uh, and so we can get away with compressed sensing. So I'm going to illustrate the idea of compressed sensing by first comparing with classical compression, which we're all much more familiar with. So the idea of compression is that most signals are sparse in some appropriate transform basis. So if I take a megapixel image and I fast Fourier transform this, I get this uh, log distribution of uh, Fourier coefficients. And it turns out that if I zero out all of the small Fourier coefficients and only keep the large magnitude ones, when I inverse Fourier transform, I basically get the same picture. Right, this is the basis of JPEG and MP3 compression. And so this begs the question, if I'm going to collect a million data points just to throw away 90 or 99% of them, maybe I could get away with just measuring 10% of the measurements in the first place and infer what those large non-zero Fourier coefficients had to be. Okay. Now, this is a lot easier said than done, and it's only because of some remarkable advances in the applied math and statistics communities in the last 10 or so years that it's possible to actually do this. So we know signals are sparse in an appropriate basis. We can get away with measuring a very small, surprisingly small amount of random measurements. In this case, you could do uh, random pixel measurements, actually. And then you can infer what the large non-zero Fourier coefficients are. Okay, so I'm going to use examples and images to start because I think that's very intuitive for most of us. We all kind of have a feeling for what, what images are. But you can think of the exact same thing with respect to your data of interest, whether it's a flow field or a time series of a hot wire measurement or whatever you're interested in. It's low dimensional in some transform space. Okay, so I like to explain a little bit of why all natural signals are compressible. This is very uh, important. And the idea is that our pixel space, or in more general context, our data space is larger than astronomical. Okay? So I want you to do a thought experiment. We're going to consider you have a 20 by 20 pixel image, and every pixel can either be black or white. Okay? How many possible images do you have? Well, I ask my students and I get the wrong answer. I'll ask you, uh, and I'm assuming you'll say something like, Two to the 400, right? Every bit can be independently flipped. I get two to the 400 possible little dinky black and white images with 20 by 20. Uh, that's more uh, possible images than there are nucleons in the known universe. It's a dinky little image, let alone uh, like a megapixel full color image is much more vast of a space. Uh, 
Um, and if I randomly sample from image space, I can sample randomly forever, and all I'm going to get is TV static. Okay? Natural images, natural signals, natural flow fields live in a tiny, tiny, minuscule corner of this vast image space. And you could spend all of your life sampling this and never find a flow field, never find a mountain. Just an idea of how vast this space is. For example, right now I'm looking at you. That's a picture in image space. You're looking at me. That's a picture in image space, right? You being born, even if no one took a picture, that's a picture in image space. This is truly vast. Uh, and all of the structured images that you ever care about, anything that's not pre-compressed, lives in this tiny, tiny corner of this vast image space. And the same is true of flow fields, the same is true of uh, hot wire measurements. These are, are very sparse in some appropriate transform basis. Okay, so the idea here is instead of collecting a ton of measurements just to transform and throw away a lot of information, instead what we're going to do is measure less measurements, the small vector y, and we're going to try to infer what this sparse vector of coefficients had to be to be consistent with those few measurements. Okay, so in this picture, uh, which was taken from Baruniak 2007, very nice review paper, uh, we have our discrete Fourier transform, some measurement matrix, our few measurements y, and we're going to try to infer uh, this sparse vector a of coefficients that are consistent with those few measurements. So this is an underdetermined system of equations. Unless I really messed up, there are infinitely many possible vectors A that satisfy those measurements Y. And if I do a least squares solution, I'm going to get a solution A with a little bit uh, of coefficients in all of these, these positions. And that's not what I want. That's not the sparsest solution. That's not consistent with the fact that if I take any data and transform it into an appropriate basis, it's sparse. And so the real magic of compressed sensing comes in this optimization here, which essentially gives us a mathematical way of finding the sparsest solution to this underdetermined system of equations in a way that actually scales to large problems. Before, if I wanted to solve this, I'd have to essentially try different combinations of sparse vectors. I'd have to pick, let's say I think that maybe only three coefficients are important. Well, I'd have to try all possible locations for those three coefficients and see if that's consistent with my measurements. So that's a brute force combinatorial search. I'd have to search for n choose k uh, if I think that I have a k sparse signal. Until the compressed sensing guys, Donahoe and Candez and Romberg and Tao among many others, gave us a mathematical foundation to actually optimize for this sparsest solution using convex optimization techniques that scale to large problems like full megapixel images or turbulent DNS. Okay, And the idea is that instead of finding the absolute sparsest vector, what we're going to find is a vector A that satisfies this system of equations that has a minimum one norm. And so the minimum one norm is a proxy for sparsity. And in a number of uh, situations, you can prove that this will actually converge to the sparsest solution of that underdetermined system of equations in a convex, uh, a convex way. So when I say convex, what you should take away from this is this scales with Moore's law. If I want to solve a problem that's bigger, I just wait for a couple of years, and I get a faster computer, and I can solve it. And that wasn't true uh, 10 years ago. Okay, so I like to give a little example, uh, and I'll point out that all of these examples that I'm going to show, so the first compression example and this and the, the later examples, you can just download these MATLAB codes from my website. Uh, this is a really, really simple example where I have a signal, which is the sum of two sine waves on the left. Okay, so I've got these two peaks uh, in the power spectrum. If I zoom in, you see that I have these kind of two frequencies that are active. And Shannon Nyquist sampling theory says I need 1,062 samples per second to adequately resolve the fastest uh, frequency in this signal. Okay, Now, what I'm going to tell you is that Shannon Nyquist is, in some circumstances, not a very good bound on how many samples you need. Okay, So it turns out this is actually only true for broadband signals, 
or signals that have lots and lots of different frequency contents. In other ways, this would be true if I had a compressed signal, but not for this signal that is sparse in Fourier. Okay, so this only has two frequencies that are active, and so I can get away with massively undersampling. So compressed sensing says that instead I can get away with an average sampling rate of 128 samples per second if I randomly distribute uh, those, those measurements in time. So I can't uh, just downsample to 128 samples per second. I have to randomly space them with an average sampling rate of 128, uh, which is considerably lower than Shannon Nyquist. And if I do that, I can solve this underdetermined system of equations for which few Fourier coefficients are most consistent with those red measurements I took up here. And when I do that, I actually find that I get a pretty good approximation to the two frequencies, the power in those frequencies, and I get very accurate signal reconstruction. Okay? This is a couple of lines of MATLAB code. This is two or three lines of MATLAB code to find the solution uh, from this sum of two sine waves. Okay, so Shannon Nyquist isn't wrong, but it's only really a hard limit for broadband signals. Okay, if I have a signal that is sparse uh, in, in frequency domain, then I can get away with massively undersampling. Okay, another application. So I'm just going to go through kind of different applications of sparsity and compressed sensing as, uh, as they've been classically treated, and then we can think about how they're useful for, for fluid dynamics. So Many decades before compressed sensing, the same ideas of sparsity and L1 minimization were actually used for uh, robustifying statistics and outlier rejection. Okay, so let's say that I want to do a POD or a DMD, right? So I collect my data and I'm going to do some linear regression to find a subspace that best describes my data. Now, by eye, it's easy to see that there's a low dimensional uh, in this case, a line that describes most of the features of this data set. But I have this big outlier that's really, really off. And we get this all the time, right? You take PIV images, you have bad, bad outliers. Okay? So if I do a least squares regression, which is what POD would do, or DMD, what I get is this massive bias that shifts my entire line down to compensate for that single outlier. Okay? Now, you don't want that. You want the original white line. So instead, what you can do is find an L1 norm minimizing solution. So instead of finding a, a plane or a line that minimizes the sum square distance to all of the points, I'm just going to minimize the one norm distance to all of these points, which is just the sum of the absolute value of that distance. And that uh, effectively robustifies this fit to this, this outlier. Okay, so this is directly applicable for flow cleansing from PIV, uh, which is a topic we're working on right now. Um, people have also used this to get better uh, POD and DMD approximations for modal decompositions. Okay, so the idea here, again, just to reiterate, is I can take a few measurements of my system and I can find the sparsest vector of coefficients that are consistent with that using the same L1 norm uh, minimization techniques. Okay, so let's try another example with a little bit of MATLAB code here. So here I'm going to make a system AX equals B. I have A as a random uh, matrix with entries that are, so it's 200 by 1,000. So B is 200 tall and X is 1,000 tall. Okay, massively underdetermined system of equations. And there's lots of different ways I could solve this. I could just do backslash or pseudo inverse in MATLAB. That's the L2 solution. And if I look at the entries of my x vector that satisfies the system of equations, if I just do the pseudo inverse, the L2 solution, you'll notice that the values in x are kind of all over the place. There's lots of values that are not zero. Most of the values are not zero. There's kind of distribution. But if I find the L1 minimum norm solution to this system of equations AX equals B, since I only have 200 equations, I should be able to satisfy this with an X vector that has exactly 200 non-zero entries. Okay? And so if I do the L1 minimum norm solution, I find that I get a vector X with 800 zeros and exactly 200 entries that are non-zero. So I get a very sparse solution to this system AX equals B, 
uh, which is essentially what our compressed sensing problem was in the first place, was trying to find a sparse vector uh, x that was consistent with my measurements in, in B. Okay, so this is one example of how the L1 norm promotes sparsity. I'm going to show you another picture that was taken from a SIAM review in 2013. Uh, this geometric picture for me is probably the clearest explanation of why an L1 norm promotes sparse solutions to a, a system of equations. Okay, so let's say I'm trying to find a solution to my underdetermined system of equations, and I try to find the minimum L2 norm solution x. That's my least squared solution. My minimum L2 uh, solution is the point at which on this line where I have the shortest distance to the origin. Okay, so it's at this point that's tangent to the circle. And notice that in this two-dimensional case, there's a little bit in the x1 direction and a, and a lot in the x2 direction. This is not a sparse solution, right? My solution has a little x1 and a little x2. But if I do the exact same problem of trying to find the minimum L1 norm solution, and L1 norms are level sets of the diamond, the minimum L1 norm solution is at this point in the diamond, which corresponds to zero in the x1 direction and a lot in the x2 direction. So this is a, a sparse solution. It's zero in one of the components. So the fact that this L1 norm is pointy means that my, my solution vector will very likely intersect it at a location where some of the components are zero. So roughly speaking, that's why I get sparse vectors that have a lot of zeros in them. Okay, which is good. So this is uh, just a geometric picture of why this, why this works. Okay, so ingredients of compressed sensing. The ingredients of compressed sensing is that I have to have a signal that's sparse in some transform basis. And just an important point is that wavelets and Fourier uh, bases are really good for engineering purposes because first of all, most signals are sparse in wavelets and Fourier if they're broad, non-localized structures like POD modes. And second of all, if I have a signal that is sparse in Fourier or wavelets, I can get away with sampling it at single point locations randomly, and I can do the compressed sensing trick. And as an engineer, I like the idea of having a point measurement because that's you know, a buoy I can drop in the ocean. That's a single point measurement I take of the system. I don't need all of my data uh, to do this compressed sensing. So the other ingredients are my measurements need to be incoherent. So an incoherent measurement essentially means if my signal is sparse in Fourier, I better not measure single frequency sines and cosines. Okay, if I, if I have a signal that's sparse in Fourier, I want to measure delta functions in space or in time because those are broadband in Fourier and they're very likely to excite any possible uh, frequencies that are active in my system. Okay, so there's this idea of incoherence. I don't want my measurements to be aligned too parallel to the basis in which my data is presumed to be sparse. And I also need sufficiently many measurements. And there's tight bounds on how many measurements you need depending on the sparsity of your problem. Uh, and you can look this up in the compressed sensing literature. Okay, so the the kind of point I'm driving towards is any data that you take or that you care about is sparse in some basis, possibly wavelets or Fourier. And the geometry of these sparse vectors is preserved if I subsample or downsample or measure a compressed version of that data. So if you take an image and I measure 1% of those pixels randomly and stack them into a vector, the geometry of the underlying signal is preserved through that compression. And this has a huge um, implication for us. So all of these modal decomposition techniques, or at least a lot of them, are built on inner products and correlations, the singular value decomposition. And I will argue that if you compress your data, your singular value decomposition doesn't change. The geometry of your data doesn't change if you compress it with good incoherent measurements if you have sufficiently many of them. Now, mathematically, this is formally called the restricted isometry property. This is kind of the cornerstone of compressed sensing theory. And as long as you satisfy this RIP condition, you preserve uh, correlations and inner products, and you can get away with doing fast numerical linear algebra to find these coherent structures. So a takeaway message that I want um, 
I want to drive home is this idea that if patterns exist in your system of interest, you don't have to measure everything about the flow just to find those, uh, those coherent structures. You can get away with massively compressing or downsampling your data, and you can still find uh, what those modes would have looked like using compressed sensing. Okay, so there's lots of applications in, uh, for example, PIV, where we might be bandwidth limited. You can only transfer data so rapidly. So maybe I want to measure 1% of my data and then infer what my coherent modes were. Okay, if you had access to your full data, if you had a big DNS and you had uh, big data, you can also do fast numerical linear algebra by first compressing your data, doing your expensive linear algebra on that compressed representation, and then you can lift back to the full state. Um, so you can do compressed singular value decompositions, compressed POD, compressed DMD, uh, and these are all examples that are in the literature today. So this idea of compressed sensing is not just useful for images. It's useful for any data that is sparse in some basis. Okay, your turbulent flow field is sparse in, I mean, I actually took a bunch of examples of turbulent data sets and they are sparse in Fourier. An instantaneous velocity field is quite, quite sparse in Fourier. Uh, if I want to drop buoys in the ocean to predict tsunamis or to predict some kind of a, you know, ocean phenomenon, we might be able to get away with fewer measurements and still infer these large scale uh, coherent structures. Uh, I have collaborators also working on detecting disease outbreaks. So you can only sample so many physical locations. Can you determine the global structure of an epidemic from a few spatial uh, point measurements? Something interesting I learned uh, over the last few years, and I, I think this is really fascinating for this community is Every flying insect, every one of them, and this is amazing, have on the order of a hundred strain sensors on their wings. No one ever, like, I didn't know this for a long time. This is kind of amazing. You have these little strain sensors built into the wings of flying insects called campaniform sensilla. They're actually these little jelly packets that when they get squeezed, they fire uh, neurons. So you get these neurons firing when the wing is bending. And one of the open questions is, what do these encode? Okay, you have this very complex insect system that's interacting with a three-dimensional, unsteady, fluid system. What is it measuring with that 50 or 100 strain, you know, set of strain sensors on their wings? And they're not, they're not, um, they're, they're very stereotypical. One moth and its brother will have the same distribution of strain sensors, which is very interesting. So it begs the question, is this doing compressed sensing? Is it you know, inferring what the dominant flow structures that it cares about are from a few measurements on its wing. Very, very interesting area of research uh, into, into how you would actually sense structures using downsampled measurements. Okay, um, I'm a little early. Uh, I'm actually gonna stop here in the interest of time and also in case there's questions because hopefully there are questions about compressed sensing. Thank you very Thank much. You.